Okay, today I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons for the variation we see in organophosphate toxicity. And the reasons I want to do this is to try and enable you to be able to see why, why this is clinically relevant and what the implications are for treatment. So here's an organophosphate, it's a diethyl organophosphate, and you can see that's the diethyl of the two red chains here. It is active because it's got an oxygen here, here's the phosphate, and then here's the rest of the molecule with the mysterious X factor. And, and this part of the molecule is quite important as we see later on because it um, is one of the things that determines how quickly the organophosphate acetylcholinesterase enzyme complex can become irreversibly bound. And here's a cross-sectional picture of the acetylcholinesterase enzyme and acetylcholine moves down this gorge um, to bind to the active site right at the bottom here of the cleft. When it binds down there to the enzyme that allows the enzyme to break down the acetylcholine um, into choline um, and therefore terminates its action as a synapse. So when an organophosphate comes down and binds in this cleft, it effectively inhibits the enzyme from breaking down acetylcholine. Then after a variable period of time, part of the organophosphate molecule that's generally sited in the X region um, leaves the molecule and that allows the molecule to have a conformational change and bind on two sites. Once it binds on two sites within this gorge, the binding is irreversible. Carbamates also bind um, down in this gorge and the newer carbamates that we use in the treatment of dementia actually have some binding up in the peripheral sites, stopping acetylcholine getting into the cleft, but that's the story for later. So let's just review normal nerve function. Presynaptically a stimulus comes down, causes acetylcholine to be released into the synapse. That moves postsynaptically where it binds and allows propagation of the impulse down postsynaptically. Acetylcholinesterase enzyme, seen here in the red cartoon, chews up that acetylcholine and it terminates uh, the stimulus in the synapse. When we inhibit that acetylcholinesterase enzyme, we get an accumulation of acetylcholine leading to overstimulation postsynaptically and this is manifest as muscarinic symptoms and as nicotinic symptoms and eventually this overstimulation at the synapse causes a decrease in the number of acetylcholine receptors which is what causes the eventual nicotinic failure um, and paralysis the so-called intermediate syndrome. So the first site we want to think about the variability relates to the actual concentrations of organophosphates most patients who are drinking organophosphates are drinking a concentrate and pretty much for all of these one or two mils of this concentrate will produce a litre of pesticide that you could use in your garden to kill aphids so you know a few mouthfuls of organophosphate is a very significant um, toxic burden the next thing to think about with the organophosphate is whether they are thions or oxones so here I'm giving you an example of chlorpyrifus and chlorpyrifus comes in the bottle as a thione that is it has a sulfur moiety here um, here are the diethyl side chains and thiones themselves generally have very little activity against the acetylcholinesterase enzyme in order to become active they have to undergo hepatic metabolism to the active oxone, and here it is here with the oxygen. Um, to get to the liver, they either have to go to the liver acutely or they come out after being redistributed from fat. So this is one of the first things you need to establish when someone's taken a poisoning. Have they taken a thion or oxone and how likely is it based on its distribution and activation to cause symptoms early? The next big question is, is this a diethyl organophosphate? So here again is our, our friend chlorpyrifus um, with its two diethyl um, moieties there, or is it a dimethyl? Um, and this is the example of phenthion. There are other organophosphates, but these are the two main classes that we're going to see.
And finally, we need to think, we've got these two classes, but what's this stuff mixed up in? And it's mixed up in solvents. Our Taiwanese colleagues have told us um, that they will have some organophosphates which are actually mixed in methanol, so patients will actually have a toxic alcohol ingestion. But here I'm looking at some data that's been produced by Michael Edelston in um, a mini pig model in Edinburgh. And what Michael did is he has looked at um, dimethoate preparation and he's looked at it with the traditional solvent um, which is um, EC40 um, and that's depicted here in orange versus a new solvent called EP35 and he's looked at the number of parameters in the pig. So first thing you'll see over here that both of the um, organophosphate preparations for the two different solvents um, have significant effects on lowering systemic vascular resistance. And you'll see that both of them are carrying the dimethoate, and so over here, this is looking at red cell cholinesterase, both the products are equally inhibiting red cell cholinesterase. But what you do find over here in Michael's study is, he, is that the traditional um, dimethoate actually produces really, really high um, lactate levels where you can actually get much lower lactate levels with the new solvent and this is possibly because you're actually able to keep the animals alive and support them with noradrenaline whereas they just would not tolerate this um, with the old solvent. So this is not something we can do much about clinically but at a public health level it's quite important because we can reduce the toxicity of these compounds. The next thing to think about is what's the state of a patient's existing acetyl cholinesterase enzyme. There are knockout mice which have no acetyl cholinesterase enzyme and yet they run around the treadmill very happily. So they've clearly made adapt adaptations at the synapse. And so it may very well be in our patients that the rate of inhibition of acetyl cholinesterase and therefore the rate of accumulation of acetyl choline might be quite important. So possibly farmers with prior exposures may actually be a bit more resistant than someone who's naive to organophosphates. So if we put the organophosphate next to the enzyme, it's gonna, it's gonna bind and it's gonna form, inhibit the enzyme. And that rate of binding, represented by this rate constant here, is highly dependent on the type of organophosphate. So the early binding uh, inhibition is much faster in general for diethyls than it is for dimethyls. Then once we um, have inhibited the enzyme, there's the possibility that it may spontaneously reactivate and this also depends very much on um, the nature of the bond between the organophosphate and the cholinesterase enzyme, so it's dependent on, on the type of organophosphate. But the other issue that we have is that if we're taking a concentrate and we've got a big dose, we may get spontaneous reactivation, but that reactivated enzyme may just be, re be inhibited by other circulating organophosphate. The next big step is the issue of aging. And the rate of aging is, depends on the type of organophosphate. And in general, Diethyl organophosphates, although they inhibit quickly, they age relatively slowly, where dimethyl is exactly the opposite. Slow for initial inhibition, but once inhibited, fast to age. Both these inhibited enzymes here, the unaged and the aged, will cause accumulation of acetylcholine in the synapse. So much of the treatment in the past has been, been driven by trying to resuscitate the enzyme before it's aged. And We've done that with a variety of oxings. And needless to say, the nature of the organophosphate is important here. The affinity of oxines for diethyl and dimethyl are different, and there's a variety of oxines. Some are better than others for dimethyl or diethyl. So just to show you a little bit more about this, so here is an example. This is an actual patient who's taken chlorpyrifos, who's been receiving um, intermittent doses of paladoxine, eighth hourly, one, just one gram. And you'll see here, this is the patient's cholinesterase. When they've come in, they've received a one gram of paladoxine and bang, it's gone up and it's less inhibited. And you can see it seesawing up and down here.
then our colleagues, um, Horst, Horst in Germany, uh, Peter Eyes in Peter Eyes lab, have looked at how much more you can reactivate if you give supertherapeutic doses of oxen. And this, if you like, is a measure of whether the organophosphates age. So here in this top line, they've given much higher doses of oxygen and they've reactivated. So it suggests at least that if this patient had a bigger dose, they would have got more reactivation. And it also gives us a, an idea of how much is potentially activatable um, in the patient or how much has aged. Look at this in contrast. Note the different, um, the different scale here um, for red cell cholinesterase. But this is done to the dimethyl organophosphate, and here is our one gram here, and we've just got a very tiny increase in red cell cholinesterase. And in fact, even with supertherapeutic doses, um, we get a little bit more activation, but very clearly most of this is aged. So this reflects both the different activity of oxymes as well as the, ra the rate of aging. Now, one of the things to consider is what actually happens when um, we can re if we can reactivate this enzyme. And one of the problems that we have is we produce um, the provocatively named POX, and POX is a phosphorylated oxime. And the problem with this is the phosphorylated oxime in itself can inhibit acetyl cholinesterase. And so how important that is relates very much to how quickly we can actually clear that phosphorylated oxygen out of the system. And that clearance is dependent on a bunch of enzymes, peroxidases and other enzymes, um, both for POX and for the original organophosphates. And it's highly likely in many of our patients that these enzymes, at least in an acute overdose, are pretty well saturated and clearance is low. This variation in enzymes may be important for low level exposures as they're genetically determined and so it's possible um, that some people in the population are more susceptible to toxicity from low level exposures. Then at the end of all of this, the accumulator of acetylcholine and its action in the synapse, as I've indicated before, um, there may be individual patient vari variability at the synapse and that may be inherited or it may relate to prior environmental exposure. So where does this leave us? In the end, it leaves us uh, with trying to tailor treatment for organophosphates based on what we know about some of the variability. So this is some data again from Sri Lanka and it shows the case fatality rate with a 95% confidence interval for dimethoate, so it's 22%, fenthion much higher and chlorpyrifos much lower. And you can see here this rapid um, aging over here which effectively meant, at least in this clinical context, for most pa many patients were presenting after four hours to hospital or to the referral hospital that they effectively had already aged and so that resuscitating or trying to restore the enzyme was not going to be viable. Whereas for chlorpyrifos, um, there was at least a reasonable chance of doing that. And this sort of data had been used to actually um, indicate that these pesticides perhaps um, should be restricted or banned because they were just too difficult to treat. So that's the uh, end of this talk and there's going to be some there'll be some other slides up on the website um, and most of these articles you'll find to be very informative reading thank you